Today on Day of Discovery, In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon. A growth process had taken place. Well, similarly, friends, a growth process has to take place in our lives. When we first meet the Lord, you know, there's nothing like it. Boy, there's nobody more enthusiastic than a new believer, and that's the way it should be. Welcome, friends, to In His Footsteps with Dave Discovery. I'm Jim Candle, and I'm here on the Hall of Steps, one of the ancient southern gates to the temple back in Jesus' time. And it's a very, very historic place for sure. I'm going to talk about something very historic, the triumphal entry of Jesus, uh, a time when the people thought they were inviting Messiah for now. They didn't understand Messiah for future reference. Dr. Steve Fine is going to join me later in the show talk about some of the things I can't talk about just because I'll be dealing with the scriptures pretty much exclusively. It's going to be a very full half hour. You stay with us. I'll be back with the Bible teaching right after this break. The triumphal entry of Jesus is uh, something that maybe is not uh, as fully appreciated by the average Bible reader as it should be. Uh, that's no fault of anyone's other than the fact that it uh, really was the culmination of literally centuries of hopeful anticipation on the part of a small segment of the population after the last of the prophets prophesied and the entry into that 400 year intertestamental period occurred. Uh, Matthew 21 has the record of it here and I'm going to read it and then we're going to comment. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, Bethphage, I'm sorry, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That, by the way, is a quote from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who had followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. First of all, um, the um, event itself. Jesus only uh, visited Jerusalem, I think, three times in his lifetime. Most of his ministry was done in the... Um, Lower and Upper Galilee and Greater Syria regions, as it was known in those days, as a province of Rome. Um, so coming to Jerusalem was a big deal, especially for his disciples. They were, you know, basically provincial Galileans. Um, he knew something was happening, and he was prepared incrementally to reveal himself before, you know, the passion, the suffering that occurred just before his crucifixion. In this case, He's thinking of Zechariah 9 and 9. He was always concerned about fulfilling the scriptures, and the prophetic scriptures especially deal again and again, sometimes directly, sometimes obliquely, with Israel's coming Messiah. This messianic hope was a critical component in the history of Israel. Uh, Messiah, the word, means anointed one. It's used 39 times in the Old Testament, and it often refers to the king of Israel and or the king of Judah. Uh, once, interestingly, this is fascinating, it's used of Cyrus of Persia. If you want to check that out, that out Isaiah 45, verse 1. Check it out. It sometimes refers to the high priest post-exile. And it is um, sometimes used metaphorically, for instance. In Isaiah 11, 1 to 10, we read about the branch. Uh, in Isaiah 9, we read about the child. 
In Isaiah 7, we read about Emmanuel, God with us. Um, in Micah chapter 5 and 2, we, we, we read about this Messiah from Bethlehem. Uh, in Jeremiah 23, referred to as the righteous branch. In um, Ezekiel 34, referred to as shepherd. And um, in Zechariah 9, donkey rider. There you go. In Psalm 72, universal ruler. Now, I can't give a, you know, a, a seminary lecture here on Messiah, but I can just hit a few high points. There was an expectation on the part of some that there would be both a kingly Messiah and a priestly Messiah. That is, someone who would administratively rule Israel and the nations, and then someone who would oversee the spiritual health of the people. And so it was a kind of a dual messiahship. But in the main, most of the focus was on this one person. Now, when Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, he started by recruiting everyday people. We know this. Come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He said to people like Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, Simon, and uh, right through the, the, the full 12. His, his message was fairly general and um, not too theologically specific, let's put it that way. But what he was tapping into was a hope that these people had that Messiah was at the door. The very point of John the Baptist's baptism, a baptism of repentance, was to cleanse the people to become a part of the great army, sons of light, who would accompany Messiah when he routed the Romans and established the kingdom of heaven on earth. So even though the people were not necessarily theologically very sophisticated, and maybe most of them even illiterate, they did hear the scriptures read. They did know what some of the major and minor prophets had said about the end of days and the coming of Israel's leader, priestly king, anointed one, Messiah. And so there was this undercurrent, let's put it that way. Otherwise, you can't explain this huge um, acclaim that Jesus received on this occasion. Now, the fact is that he had already made a name for himself through his three years of ministry. Uh, the thing that, of course, appealed to most people was his miraculous ministry. Even though Jesus sometimes made short shrift of his miraculous ministry, saying to those he healed, don't tell anybody about this, just keep it between us. They never really followed through on that, they'd tell everybody. Uh, so, you know, Jesus understood human nature and he knew that uh, many of them followed him just because he seemed to be offering healing and free food, <laughs> feeding 5,000 on one occasion, 4,000 on another. But the, the momentum had built slowly, 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 slowly. And so there was an expectation, there was a tradition that Messiah would one day enter through the Eastern Gate, riding, you know, uh, on a, some kind of a charger. Um, so, when this happened, there was a, um, already momentum, already expectation. Now keep in mind, these people, and there may have been thousands of them who greeted him as he rode the, these donkeys into Jerusalem, they may have been the same ones who a few days later were saying, crucify him. But at this point, they're saying, Hosanna. Now Hosanna, we, we see as an, uh, an expression of praise, and that's what it has become. But Hosanna in the old Hebrew, Hoshiana, it simply means, simply means save now. Save now. Yesha, the, the Hebrew root from what from which comes Yeshua, Jesus. Um, save now. What they were saying is, okay, welcome. Let's get your throne ready. Let's route those nasty Romans. Let's uh, get the you know, end of days going here. Let's fulfill the eschatological um, agenda here. Uh, you're the guy, and we're with you. We're on side with you. And before we're too hard on any of the public, let's understand that even the disciples themselves figured that um, this was going to happen and that they were going to be Jesus' ruling cabinet. 
We're going to take a little break. When I come back, Dr. Steve Fun is with us, and he is going to give us a lot more background and fill in a lot of the gaps as we talk about the triumphal entry. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. So it's our interview segment again, and I'm here in Jerusalem right near the Western Wall. Uh, a lot of tourists walking past and sometimes some bar mitzvah celebrations going on. Don't let any of that distract you, friends. We're just going to soldier on here. Dr. Steve Fine is my guest. He's the founder and president of the University of the Holy Land. He's also an archaeologist and a longtime friend of mine. I'm delighted to have him with me. The triumphal entry, Steve, uh, in Matthew 21, uh, it's in other Gospels as well, but we have this story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on, as Matthew says, a, a donkey and the colt of uh, a donkey. Uh, and there's thousands of people celebrating his arrival, looking to him as uh, a conquering hero. Would, was this a result of some kind of a massive publicity campaign? Or was there an atmosphere, a culture here uh, that was fueled by his miraculous ministry that says this is the one, this is the Messiah. There was a certain amount of expectation at that time that, that there would be the coming of a Messiah. And all of those aspects that you're speaking of are, are, are really part of that image of the anointed one that will, will come at the, right, at the proper time. Mount of Olives was, was part of the story. The, um, there's a lot of give and take in terms of how people understand whether these, which kinds of branches are laid down on the, on the ground, whether people's clothing and things like this, so, like, some of which aren't in the scriptures at all. Just, 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 just stop there for a sec. What about that business? I mean, that's very uncommon behavior, is it not, or is it? To lay down your, your, your coat, your cloak on, on the path that uh, a donkey's gonna pass by on or to put down uh, branches from trees. Like, was that some kind of a, a symbol of royalty that they were welcoming? Or what, what was that about? Yeah, there is that type of a thing where uh, in order to, uh, even as people talk about taking your coat off and let, letting somebody walk a, across. Yeah, being a gentleman, uh, oh, yeah, or letting a woman cross across a puddle. But it's, it's definitely as a way of giving honor to the one that's coming in. Do you think Jesus was surprised by this? I don't think so. I think that what he's, um, he also probably very much understood that what was going to, to follow was something much worse. Yeah. A week before to have this kind of a procession, but he, he knew right off the bat that the Messiah that people were waiting for is not the Messiah that he is because they were waiting for a Messiah that had certain elements to his, his life and certain things that were going to happen where chick, 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 it was going to happen. He comes to Jerusalem. This is number one. He, he throws off the yoke of the Gentiles. He hasn't done that yet. Right. He creates an eternal reign. They thought that that was going to happen at that time. And he knew that he had to die. He knew that he had to, he had to say yes to death. Mm. And knew, knew that that would be a tremendous disappointment for his disciples and everybody else that he, that he died on the cross. So he played with the, with the actual story. Yeah. But the rest of that storyline would not happen for many years to come. Yeah. Uh, give me a little background on this messianic hope. This was not a, a recent phenomenon. This is something that was rooted in uh, biblical history, was it not? Like, uh, how, how did this whole thing emerge? The, the understanding, you know, that the Messiah is uh, supposed to be a, a man and supposed to uh, be born of a woman is also something that is going in sync with the understanding that the Messiah was there before time, that he's made of God's stuff. You see, he's, he's there with the Holy Spirit. That's why Christianity really was being quite conservative, not allowing all these other things to be God's, but the things that were non-created right. were of that same stuff. When everything else was created, the Messiah comes into being during uh, the creation week and is there to take what is, has, is fallible as far as the creation to make it right. 
And these different times in history in which the Messiah comes into history and barges into history sometime as an angel of the Lord or in some other way, you'll find that in this case, he's coming to die. Nobody was expecting that, no. except for a few groups, minor groups that actually wrote. And we can see that on a number of different things that were found in the last, last 50 years at Qumran, in the midst of their library, and also in a stone that was found across on the other side of Jordan about the need for this, this uh, figure, this, uh, this individual that was chosen of God to die and rise after three really? days. Really? So I know that there was this uh, almost remnant of people throughout those intertestamental periods who were, who were holding to a messianic hope maybe little prayer groups, little Bible study groups, I don't know, but I didn't realize that there were those who really understood he wanted to die. Like all those times that Jesus um, warned his disciples, they didn't seem to hear him, didn't seem to get it. But what you're saying is that there were people who didn't anticipate this. Yes, a gener even a generation before uh, his, his coming. This is the, well, let's say during, during the time of his, his childhood, there, there were people, both the Jesselson stone that they are the stone of uh, vision of Gabriel, which is found over on the other side of Jordan, and the um, Son of God text that was found in Qumran. Uh, both of these things were, were actually already written before uh, Jesus ever reached maturity. Now, with, with these uh, insights from the, from the scrolls and from this thing across the Jordan, would they reflect some uh, attachment or association to Isaiah 53? Uh, or would that be totally separate from that passage? You know, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our pieces upon him, by his stripes we are healed. Uh, would that be separate from that? Or do you think that there may have been something that related to the Isaiah uh, insights? Uh, they're definitely all hand in hand. There's, there's, it's not that any of them uh, reading these passages all once a year through the through the prophets every year along with the Torah they all know it yeah and the thing is is that um, when we have a a major event like this and everyone in the north of the country they're looking for somebody like Elijah to come like another prophet to come right. and he accepted that term prophet but when they called him uh, Messiah are you the Messiah coming to uh, to Peter claiming that he's the Messiah, he says, yeah, but you have to under understand really what has to happen to this Messiah. Right. So he wasn't big on them being calling him Messiah because it's not he's not the Messiah that they learned about in Sunday school. Right. And so he, he had to push them back on that because he knew that there was gonna be a major falling out. In fact, you remember the first witnesses to the resurrection came back into that room and, and told everyone, look at, He's gone from the tomb and he rose from the dead as he said he would. No, someone told, went to the tomb and stole his body. Yeah. They didn't get it. They still didn't get it, even, even after that event happened. They didn't believe the women, idle chatter. Well, there's even uh, Mary Magdalene came, yeah. came in at first yeah. and said that he, someone stole his body. So yeah. there's, there's all these different confusion of events going on there where suddenly they all all the disciples with the scriptures that were written, with the gospels that are written, are, are bearing witness to and admitting that they just really missed it. They didn't know, but when they went back and searched the scriptures like they said in other writings, all of a sudden it started to become clearer and clearer to them that this in fact is what was anticipa anticipated to become. Do you suppose the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus over that 40 day period um, was what convinced them that truly this resurrection had happened. I mean, surely they knew they weren't having some kind of a mass hallucination. Was it the appearances that would have convinced them? I, you stop and think of somebody who should have gotten the story right, and that is Peter. Yeah. And he's the one who says, I'm gonna follow you to the cross. Yeah. Okay, now it's finally coming true. Okay, you're gonna die on the cross. I'll follow you to the cross. And he has a uh, um, somebody's already inside the room where Jesus is being, being uh, tried with, through false witnesses. 
So one of Jesus' disciples is already in the room. Peter comes into the courtyard and warms himself over a charcoal fire. And he warms his mother with a char charcoal fire. He could have gone in, become the second witness to counter the witnesses that were given the false witness. But he hesitated. And someone came up and said, well, you're one of them. Right. And he, he choked. Yeah. In fact, he went so far as to denying himself, but with a kind of a cursed denial that I by no means are, are his, know this man. And so he disqualified himself to be able to even go at that point, become his witness to help him out of the situation. I mean, this is almost as bad as what Judas has done. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't go for it and, and, and fight for him. And Jesus turned around and looked at him when that, that cock crowed. And you can imagine the chill that went through him. You mentioned Judas. I got to ask you this. There's been a lot of speculation as to why Judas did what he did. He obviously didn't do it for the money because he threw the money away. One theory is that he was trying to force Jesus' hand, his messianic hand. If he just put enough stress, enough pressure, enough pressure on him, get him arrested, get him in front of Caiaphas, get him in front of Pilate, then he will have to reveal himself as the son of God and call those legions of angels and, and usher in the messianic kingdom. Do you think that could have been a potential uh, rationale for Judas's behavior? Well, there's all kinds of things that, that he, um, he obviously repented in his own way afterwards, yeah. as, as Peter did. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, Judas was constantly trying to, to uh, find his own way. Uh, each of the disciples trying to rise to the top. Yeah. Peter, Peter being, after he it gets A plus for saying, uh, you're the Messiah. Yeah. Jesus tells them about what's gonna happen to this Messiah, and then Peter ends up scolding Jesus. And he's, here he is coming up to the front and all the disciples watching, and then Jesus turns around and looks at the disciples. And he looks at, then he looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> he says, don't get out from in front of me, get thee behind me, you know? Isn't that amazing? From one minute to the next, yeah, you from know? Hero to zero. Hero to zero, <laughs> just, just like that. Yeah. Hero to zero. That's but, but, you know, like a book that, title. But all these disciples are admitting that they were not up to it. But when, when Jesus sees Peter again up in the Galilee, when he has called his disciples to go out fishing with him, you know, he's getting kind of tired here. I don't know if he's coming back or what. And they're out there fishing, failing, and then having the, the miraculous draft of fish. Peter recognized it, and he admitted that he only had brotherly love for Jesus three times, even though Jesus asked him, do you have self-sacrificing yeah, love now? Yeah. And so in place of that, those denials that he made, he confessed. You know, the word confess, homologeo, means to speak like, it's to mm. agree. Mm. It isn't that we're telling God anything new, it's that we, we're agreeing with him. Steve Fine, thank you so much. <laughs> we could talk for hours. <laughs> we'll take a little short break, friends, and I'll be back with a close right after this. And now we return to In His Footsteps with Jim Cantillon on Day of Discovery. You know, we're not necessarily um, coming from the context that those crying Hosanna were coming from in terms of this long-lived messianic hope that they had been hanging on to for about four centuries. But the fact is, friends, that all of us, when we meet the Lord, are meeting him in an entry-level kind of way. Just as the people who called Hosanna didn't fully appreciate or understand what Jesus was all about, so too we can be a little bit off base in terms of how we see Jesus, at least initially. That's not uh, any reason to find fault. But what I'm saying is this, even the disciples misunderstood who Jesus was. It took them three years of intense relationship and following him around in ministry to even get to the point where they were at least feeling a little guilty when they forsook him and fled at his crucifixion. But it was much later after the day of Pentecost that they began to understand the full scope of Jesus' ministry and his impact in their lives. 
a growth process had taken place. Well, similarly, friends, a growth process has to take place in our lives. When we first meet the Lord, you know, there's nothing like it. Boy, there's nobody more enthusiastic than a new believer, and that's the way it should be. But the Bible says, like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. The Bible talks about, you know, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, there is a process, friends. It is a it doesn't mean that your salvation is on tender hooks by no stretch, but just like you're a baby to begin with and you become eventually an adult, so too spiritually you grow and you grow and you grow. So let's keep that in mind next time we're a little frustrated with our present status. We're a work in progress. Praise the Lord for that. I'm Jim Canalan. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Join us again next week at this same time for another Day of Discovery. Day of Discovery is a video outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada and is supported by the free will gifts of friends like you who enjoy these programs. For more information about Our Daily Bread Ministries Canada, please visit us online at ourdailybread.ca.